We will now move into the finance specific portion of today's presentation. Information that we share with you today hopefully will equip you for your role in providing oversight and rigorous financial monitoring of the funds that are in your charge. It's fiduciary. As a recipient of federal funds, you, we are obligated to provide oversight and protection of the money. Let's think about your process and how it will be structured. It will likely involve interviews with key staff. Think about people within the organization that hold positions of trust for the protection and the monitoring and the use and the reporting of the money. Your review will certainly involve a thorough review of financial records and supporting documentation. How will you receive this information? How will you review this information? What might be done on site? What could you do electronically? This may take some planning on your part and maybe some trial and error as financial records tend to be voluminous. Staffing the financial component of the monitoring review is important to this process. Who should review the financial records? Who on your staff is available and knowledgeable of what is required? How will your staff be trained to pick up on key details? Identify and address potential conflicts of interest. Has your staff or the potential monitoring staff previously worked for or with your grantee? Is there any other potential area of conflict that might compromise the integrity of the review? Now we will share information about some financial focal points for the review. I will turn the floor to Marcos. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as we speak about um, financial management and the people, the people that you have to interview, here are some key people that you want to put at the front of your list when you're creating your tools for your subrecipient monitoring. Your financial leader, um, your human, re human resource manager, and whoever is responsible for procurement. And in those interviews, me, what you want to do is ask questions around policies and procedures from the financial leader, you wanna ask how are their financial records kept? Who is responsible for what? Um, we send out a detailed um, checklist and monitoring tools for you to know what the state is coming to look for. So I would urge you to look at those tools to really pull out what is necessary for the review of your sub-recipients. Um, in each interview, what you wanna make sure you definitely ask is is there any suspect, suspicion of any fraudulent activity? Um, depending upon who you're dealing with, you may find out some information that you may not have otherwise known. You want to use these interview these interviews as a tool to really dig deeper for anything that may have been at the front of your mind throughout the year. Okay, cash management. This is where you're digging deeper and you're actually pulling the information of their financial status. Um, their bank statements, their financial reports, anything that they've submitted to you throughout the year that's been required via contract um, or for you to stay compliant for state, state needs. Um, I'm not sure that you will be giving advances to your subrecipient, but those are things to definitely look at throughout the process when you're creating your subrecipient monitoring tools for the year. Um, and again, Make sure you put things in your subrecipient tools that will that can span across any sub that you have, and that may be something that you have to check on on a regular basis, or something that is you know red flag. You know that's something that you just want to always be very mindful of. Anything that you can that you can ask every sub without it being biased um, is a good way to just get to the nitty gritty of what is necessary uh, for your monitoring needs. Prepaids, from the state level, as far as you know, the, into the local area having prepaids, that is something that's common. We don't see it as often, but we definitely see it more in the metro areas, things such as gas cars or martyr passes. Um, if your subs are doing anything of that nature, this is the space in which you actually create a tool to where you're checking to make sure that they are 
um, compliant with, first of all, a process as to how they're handling their pre-phase. What, how do they identify them and are they segregated? How are they keeping track of the inventory and how they're keeping track of them going out? Are they under lock and key? The procedures definitely, your policies and procedures definitely play a key role here um, in ensuring that the local, the local area, that whatever your policy is as a local area is being followed, but also whatever the subrecipient, if they're doing prepays, that that is being followed properly as well. Salary and the cost of allocation. Um, first of all, from the state level, you know, or from the local area, excuse me, local area and the local level, you know that there is a cap on salary per federal regulations. Um, if there are some caps per your contract, this is the space in which you check those. Um, when you are checking to be sure that they're charging the correct time to the correct program, this is where you do that. Um, create the tool so that it definitely cover all the necessary um, items that you have to check off your list to ensure that you are being compliant as well as the local area. And I'm turning it over to Scott. So this concerns the use of contracting. So we require for subrecipients that they need to include these provisions in their contracts since these are federal funds. These are con these are provisions required uh, under the 2 CFR 200. Uh, if you have any further questions regarding these particular provisions, I would recommend uh, consulting the 2 CFR 200. So just to review, subrecipients should clearly list these contract provisions required under local, state, and federal law. Contracts for more than the simplified acquisition threshold, currently set at $150,000, must address administrative, contractual, or legal remedies in instances where contractors violate or breach contract terms and provide for such sanctions and penalties as appropriate. So what we're looking for on this provision is a provision that states uh, legal uh, matters such as arbitration, the ability to terminate a contract without cause if you're the entity that is providing the grant uh, to the subrecipient. There's, there's equal employment opportunity for contracts over 10,000. We're looking for Copeland, the Copeland Anti-Kickback Act for construction repair provisions, the Davis-Bacon Act, Contract Work Hours and Safety Standards Act for constructions over 100,000, agency reporting requirements, rights to inventions made under a contract or agreement, as to records, three-year retention, conflict of interest, Clean Air Act and Federal Water Pollution Control Act, the Bird Anti-Lobbying Amendment, debarment and suspension provisions, and re procurement of recovered materials. Now for this particular provision, what we are looking for is a provision that mentions the Solid Waste Disposal Act. Uh, again, you can consult 2 CFR 200 uh, for more information on that provision. So what we are looking for in within the files of these contracts uh, is documents that pertain to, for example, contract price, not based on cost plus percentage of costs, profit as a distinct light item that is separately managed and negotiated, contract relationship of a subrecipient versus a vendor. Really, this should be an issue if, the per if what you are monitoring is the subrecipient. Uh, note that this documentation needs to be completed early in the procurement process so that uh, you can see a proper chain that the process was followed under the subrecipient. Uh, payments made in accordance with contract terms and files contained copies of invoices supporting documentation, providers justification of need for advances if applicable, relevant status reports as detailed in the written contract agreement such as performance monitoring, resolutions, reports, etc. Indicate the type of report, uh, correspondence, any correspondence regarding contracts uh, that would could impact analysis of goods or services received, the review or approval process. You should also include required documents such as 
a complete signed contract that includes the contractor name, contract amount, any amendments and copies of subcontracts or memorandums of agreement, if applicable to those contracts. We're also looking for scope of work, requirements, deliverables, and outlines for measuring performance. Uh, things that you would look for in, say, an application that the subrecipient is providing you at, at, when you are looking for procuring contracts approved and signed based on board delegation of authority, as well as the funding sources. So say you are, they are using, say, dislocated worker uh, money or youth money or adult money under WIOA. Contract administration procedures performed and documented. So we are looking for how these contracts are managed and whether or not the sub, subrecipient entity is maintaining those files. So obviously you wanna make sure that the files be maintained are up to date for that, for those particular funds. The process improved contract payments, contract activities are being periodically monitored by the subrecipient. We're also looking at contract monitoring procedures that are performed and documented, compliance with federal, state agency rules, laws, regulations, or program requirements compliance with contract, grant award, and agreement terms and conditions. Uh, all deliverables were received per contract items and any corrective actions uh, processes for those contracts is in place. So once you've completed your monitoring, uh, you're looking for the subrecipient at whether or not any corrective actions were needed and whether or not those were properly communicated and followed up with, with the subrecipient for any particular contracts and then any additional procedures for subrecipients that are in place based on either the subrecipients policies or the local policies for the entity that gave the funds. And then finally, we're looking at close-up procedures that are performed and documented, all goods and services that were received per the contract terms, payments that were approved and correctly calculated, final cost price budget analysis that was performed, have any follow-ups with contractors for any problems noted, uh, follow-ups with, with any issues in management as needed. They should also look for procedures uh, for problems with vendor performance that were performed and documented, entity processes that were uh, documented and followed, appropriate levels of management that were notified. And then finally, contract termination procedures that were performed and documented. So if there were any issues that required an early termination of a contract, you're looking to make sure that those processes were followed and documented based on what is described in your own local policies as well as the policies of the subrecipient. And then appropriate levels of management were notified and could follow up on. For subrecipient contract provisions, what we are looking for is when you are reviewing subrecipient contracts that they are actually being identified as a subrecipient contract. For that, we, there are numerous provisions that are required to, you know, to show identification as a subrecipient. So these are required prov provisions such as uh, the Federal Award Identification Number or FANE that is included in the contract. Uh, the CFDA numbers need to be included in the contract. Uh, compliance information provided to the subrecipient that is included in the contract. Any subrecipient monitoring requirements, the Single Audit Act and other audit requirements. Uh, technical advice and training provisions, uh, indirect cost rates, notified of requirement to permit pass-through entity and its auditors access to their records for monitoring and, and auditing purposes. So just to reiterate, all of these provisions are things you want to look for uh, as you're monitoring a subrecipient, making sure that all of these contract provisions are in place, and then any corrective actions are followed up on and documented. And with that, I will turn over to uh, Renee Robinson. Thank you, Scott. I'm Renee Robinson with the finance team. And today I will touch base on monitoring in relation to disbursements, purchasing, common findings, and corrective action. The process of monitoring disbursements requires the review of financial samples, monthly credit card statements, monthly travel, and reimbursements. The process of monitoring purchasing requires the review of contracts and purchases made against the contract, bids and competitive procurement, small purchases, sole source, 
or other non-competitive proposals. Common findings that can deem the guarantee as being non-compliant are as follows. Financial management systems, cash management and revenue recognition, prepaid programs, timekeeping, salary, cost and allocations, disbursements, purchasing, contracting, sub-recipient financial monitoring. The monitoring team will specify in the financial final monitoring report the period allotted to complete the required corrective action. The LWDA is to establish a time frame to submit a corrective action plan. Findings of non-compliance will require prompt corrective action or sanctions can be implemented. A corrective action response must be submitted within an established time frame of receiving the financial monitoring report. Failure to complete the corrective actions described in the corrective plan within the specified time limits may result in imposing of additional penalties under the policy, elevating the sanction level and or withholding grant payments. Thank you. I will now turn it over to Sheree Olivis and programs. Thank you, Renee. This section of the training, Andrew and I will focus on programmatic subrecipient monitoring. We embedded a timeline that OWD uses for our on-site monitoring. However, that may vary depending on your LWDA. This overview will include the programmatic pre-monitoring, the on-site visit, as well as post-monitoring. At the beginning of programmatic monitoring, desk review is recommended. So at, when you begin the desk review, for a program, this typically begins two to three weeks out or two weeks before the monitoring team is expected to be on site. A risk assessment of each subrecipient should be conducted at the beginning of the desk review. The risk assessment is usually used to identify this year's risk level and number of case files to be pulled. Also included in the desk review is a review of the previous year's findings, and they are used to narrow and concentrate the scope of review. Additionally, each LWDA varies on how they issue them in terms of formality, and this risk assessment does not have to be a formal report. Above is a good example of a risk assessment. You can use this template or review a minimum of 10% of the subrecipient's case files. I will walk you through a few of the questions that can be presented on a risk assessment. Number one, does the subrecipient have prior experience with the same or similar subawards? 10 points for new programs for, of this entity, five points for prior experience with the program but managed for less than three years, and zero points with prior experience with the same award. Number two, does the subrecipient have new personnel or new substantially changed systems? For example, is there a new director, youth programs manager, or adult and dislocated worker programs manager, new compliant or new financial managers? Substantial changes in personnel has the potential to greatly impact the system and the operations of the organization. So 15 points for extensive change, eight points for some change, and zero points for little to no change. Number three, does the self-recipient have a significant history of oversight or monitoring findings? 25 points if more than one instance of noncompliance, 10 points if a single instance of noncompliance, and zero points for full compliance. And number four, does the provider lack effective operational and fiscal procedures and controls? Are there policies and procedures that the subrecipient has put in place that protects the organization and maximizes the efficiency of its operations and promotes the atmosphere of compliance among its employees. So 20 points if more than one instance of noncompliance, five points a single instance of noncompliance, and zero points for full compliance. Based on the results of the risk assessments, you will select the case files. A request for case files from the subcontractors will be made based off of the following criteria. Previous year findings and observations, the risk level of using the risk assessment. The samples can be a percentage of case files or a set number based on the risk level. 
For example, many LWDAs use a minimum of 10%. And typically, this process of selecting the case files is done about two weeks or two weeks before the on-site visit. And the 10% of the case files is a baseline, and each LWDA will adjust it based on their subcontractor's risk level. On-site interviews are also included in the monitoring team process. We recommend in-person interviews, however you can use video call or phone call, but face-to-face -face is preferred. Staff to be reviewed um, include director, program manager, case manager, first contact. Um, however, this is not specific, but based on the job functions. For instance, um, what we are referring to as a case manager for that subrecipient, that title may be an employment specialist. Or the first contact may be the one-stop operator. Uh, however, we do recommend that you identify the corresponding individual with the role prior to the start of the on-site visit. <clears throat> we find the most engaging questions during the on-site interview to be open-ended versus yes or no. We always recommend to ask a fraud question. Um, it's also important to ask questions around training. How is the staff trained? How are, the, how are they updated on policy and procedures, changes, as well as updates? Um, additional questions. What challenges does that individual face to deliver their services day to day? Is there a need for additional training or resources from your LWDA and or from the state level? Another best practice that we um, we like to see implemented is to document those interview questions as you're asking. Um, so that way at the end of the interview, you're not trying to recall um, some of their questions or to do a summary. So as you ask the questions, you wanna document the response. During the the monitoring process, there is a case file review that has to be conducted and we utilize various tools. <clears throat> a few examples of what can be found on the tools. Um, for the youth tool, you have the eligibility, the documentation, which verifies school status, low incomes, household size, bar barriers, grievance forms, ISS forms, WEX forms, support, supportive service forms, and the signatures if the youth is out of under 18 years of, excuse me. On the adult and dislocated worker tools, you have the eligibility, work or work and employment status, Include that includes unemployment insurance benefits, income verification, grievance, priority of service, supportive service, ITA documentation, objective assessment, and IEP. This is not a comprehensive list. These are just examples of what should be included on these tools. And prior to the start of monitoring, OWD conducts a training where we share our tools for the, that program year monitored. Feel free to use those tools or locate your own or create your own that works best for your LWDA and be sure to include local policy specific information. Because OWZ conducts an online review of the local areas, the gold standard would be for the local areas to conduct an electronic case file review for your subrecipients. This case file review is typically conducted one week before the on-site visit. Well, we consider on-site monitoring is the time spent at that facility. However, the monitoring process can be done electronically, especially for those rural areas where counties are widespread. Implementing electronic reviews is suggested as well. Upon arrival on the site, we also recommend that you request additional samples. Um, we recommend five, however, that may vary depending on the size of the grant. Um, and you should notify that subrecipient of those additional files upon arrival, and you should receive them the same day. While on site, you also want to conduct those on site interviews that were that should have been scheduled prior to arrival. Um, you also want to request missing documentation. We find it helpful to track that missing documentation in a spreadsheet and share that spreadsheet at the end of the review versus as things arise. Um, as you can imagine, you know, if you're reviewing a file, something's missing and they're looking for that information, it can kind of be a shuffle. Um, at the conclusion of the visit, you want to gather all the missing documentation, in a spreadsheet, provide that to them as well as provide a timeline to submit and provide that the missing documentation. And that time span again may vary depending on how many files you're reviewing, whether it's a day, a week, um, vice versa.
after the on-site visit is done, you want to save and store your tools. I think that is very important to have. Again, you want to include the date and who reviewed each item. Um, so that way, if we come and we monitor those same case files and documentation was missing, um, you have documentation on your end of who actually reviewed that case file and where they put that information that was missing when you reviewed the file as well. You want to ensure all documents are scanned and uploaded. Um, in the appropriate section on the WorkSource Georgia portal. And also you want to have um, a process to correct, to track the corrective action, whether it's via email, Dropbox, Basecamp, um, or any other um, type of database that you like to use. Now I will pass it to Ms. Karen. Thank you, Cherie. This part of the presentation will cover an overview of the Equal Opportunity Tool as well as the Internal Control Questionnaire. EO monitoring is required for anyone receiving WIOA Title I funds and WIOA Section 188 should be used as a guide to ensure compliance with the equal opportunity and non-discrimination portions of WIOA. Section 188 lays out the administrative obligations for recipients of WIOA funds, such as record keeping, notice, communication, providing universal access and other duties assigned under the non-discrimination plan. In accordance with these requirements, there must be some form of monitoring of the local area subrecipients to ensure those EO provisions are being met. We are providing our equal opportunity testing tool along with this recording that will go into more details than we have time for. So we encourage you to view the tools at your leisure and borrow any questions as you see fit to incorporate into any existing tool you may be using. Portions of the tool only apply to the local area as the entity being monitored, but there are other sections that can easily be translated to monitoring a subrecipient. For example, one of the interview questions from the EO tool asks, does the EO officer monitor and investigate to ensure that the recipient and its subrecipients are not violating their non-discrimination and equal opportunity obligations under WIOA Title I and this part? The local area can use interviews with subrecipient staff to determine whether this requirement is being met and to ensure that subrecipients have adequate understanding of the EO and non-discrimination requirements that are associated with, associated with receiving these federal funds. For example, are subrecipient staff aware of the local area's EO policy? Do they know where to find the grievance form to give to participants? If someone wants to submit a complaint, are staff aware of how this process is handled? The other general compliance area that should be looked at has to do with the entity's internal control environment. This includes things like the subrecipient's internal oversight for management structure, such as a clear organizational chart, appropriate approval, and authorization structure, as well as integrity, integrity and ethical values that include code of conduct, IT, and data protections. A review of this information can be completed through interviews of subrecipient staff, particularly those in leadership roles. These types of topics are decided from the top down, so you would be looking at how these policies were put into place and also how the information is communicated down to subrecipient staff. Are they aware of those internal procedures? The ICQ tool, OWD uses is heavily correlated with the finance tool and typically when the local area does financial monitoring, these questions are also addressed. But if they are not already included in the financial side in your local process of monitoring sub subrecipients, they should be evaluated. When OWD monitors the local area, the question on our tool mostly deals with policy and procedures which would have been created at the local level. However, a subrecipient may have their own policy and procedures that pertain to WIOA activities. There should be a working relationship with the local area and their subrecipients to ensure the policies are in agreement. But if the subrecipient 
does not have their own policy and are simply following the local policy, then you should still be verifying that it is indeed the case. Which again, this can be determined through interviews with subrecipient staff or perhaps verifying that training was conducted or a memo was sent out to subrecipient staff detailing those policies. Your next presenter is Brittany Singer. Thank you, Karen. Um, so that concludes our training on subrecipient monitoring. If you have any questions about the topics that we've covered today, um, you'll see on the slide here, please submit those to our WorkSource Academy email at worksourceacademy at tcsg.edu. Uh, we will be glad to answer any of those. And again, we are planning to develop a follow-up session. So if there are areas that you would like us to expand on from today's training or additional topics you'd like us to cover, um, feel free to submit those as well. We'll, of course, keep everyone posted about future training, and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, so finally, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to our team here for pulling all of this together. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you so much for joining us.